She is a theater artist and arts educator and has worked with Salvage Vanguard Theater, The Rude Mets, The Vortex, Paper Chairs, and Teatro Viva. She is a former managing director of Salvage Vanguard and was with the organization with a lost its space on the road. Her award-winning one-woman hack show, Half Breed Southern Friday, was produced as part of the performing Latin series at UT and was directed by none other, none other than Lori Carlos. And I believe she has a room in the church right now. She can tell people about that. Uh, yes, any of you artists can, can promote you from the stage or from over here. Alan Garcia, we're on the end. Independent archivist, uh, native of Austin, and creator of the Instagram account Atex Burial Archive. I highly recommend following it. It's a virtual museum of visual culture that documents Latinx and African American neighborhood history. Alan gathers um, photographs, um, driver's license, um, advertising, all kinds of uh, two dimensional um, archival ephemera and keeps it going online. So she's Solis, who is a native of Boston as well. Um, she's a visual artist who's currently sharing studio time and practice between here and Mexico. Her work includes multi-layered collage paintings, constructed of paint and hand paper, hand dyed paper, vinyl, plastic, and images from found books and magazines. She shows nationally at various institutions, including uh, the Contemporary Arts Museum in Denver. She is also a DJ with and the manager of the Boston chapter of Trinita Vinyl Club, and she serves on the programming committee of Las Vegas Atex. Um, John Yancey is a professor of studio art at the University of Texas. His artistic practice includes leading community-based mural painting and creating ceramic tile mosaic public artwork, artworks. Among the many pieces he has created both here and elsewhere is the monumental mosaic mural right over here on East 11th Street at the Charles Ernie, uh, Ernie Plaza, right at 11th and Waller. It's called Rhapsody. Thank you very much, everybody. I really appreciate it, and I'll turn it over to Priscilla. So, um, I know my bio didn't say anything about art, so some of y'all might be wondering, you know, yeah, she runs a particular color organization, but what they have to do with anything. Um, first of all, I'm um, creating these thoughts and so that has anything to do with anything. Um, and, but the other thing is, arts program in Chicago, and I have been curating and producing an arts program um, since 2006 at all, and so that's actually one and that I love to <laughs> so, um, so thank you all for being here tonight for a conversation on placemaking and displacement, a public dialogue, and so I'm so happy to be on the panel with uh, these great folks doing great art in the city, and those of you who are in the audience who are doing the work also. And so, um, we have questions. So we can, you know, I'm, I'm a community organizer, so this kind of thing is like, you know, whatever. Um, so we'll just do this how we feel, right? Um, but also, I think that I would, I think I need to put this out there as a series of conversations. And so this panel is not going to be representative of all voices, and we're not going to cover all aspects of everything tonight. And I'm happy that there is a series because there are many people who um, deserve to be on the stage and who will have the opportunity to do that. So we look forward to the opportunity for folks to be able to um, share other perspectives that may not be shared tonight. So just want to put that out before we move forward. Uh, so we can just kind of start with the question. Um, everybody doesn't have to. <laughs> okay, I just want to make sure that, you know, I'm a taskmaster too. Um, so I'm big picture and detail, so um, I can get it done. But I want to just know that I'll just kind of answer um, the questions and we can, folks can just kind of chime in. We may not have something to say about everything, but we'd love that. And I may make it direct this in direct the question so directly at folks. And so um, here we are to talk about the displacement and placement. Um, so first question is, how can the Austin 
Arts Committee worked positively and worked together within the city in which profound economic and cultural displacement has occurred and is occurring. So, um, anybody want to start that? No, I'm going to ask that to do this. I'm pass the mic in case we're really want to talk. Um, I think that, oh, that's nice. Hi, theater artist. That's loud. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, before I get my hands, can we all just take a deep breath together? Let's go. Can we take a deep breath? Everybody breathe in. Everybody breathe out. We'll do it one more time. Breathe in. Breathe out. Let's see, it's the last one. Breathe, breathe out. Shake the shoulders, move your body, move your head, move your head. That's a heck of a question, is it not? Um, <laughs> you had to do that and dissect it and be like, okay, so what is the right way? Um, I think that uh, the answer where I want to speak to is from the personal. Um, there are a lot of systematic issues that we can kind of go in. I think we all know what those are. Um, and so I think that the only way I can feel empowered as an artist and previously as an administrator is trying to really focus on what it is that I can do. Um, and so, knowing the constraints of the city, knowing how systematic racism has affected people of color here, how it affects the arts, all of the education system. Um, so, what are the opportunities that you can leave a brick in the door? Um, what are the opportunities that you can use whatever privileges that you may have, whatever access to resources that you may have that someone who does not look like you, uh, does not have share your representation, may not have access to? When, what is your personal commitment to making sure that you are holding space for someone else um, to maybe share the resources that you have, um, have an opportunity at the art opportunity that you have. Um, to go a step further, what I am also seeing quite clearly is going to require that us all say, oh, hey, I want that. Pause and say, hey, <laughs> who also wants it and doesn't have the opportunity to get it like I do? and quite possibly deserves it, maybe a little bit more in a different way than I do. Um, so I like personal accountability. We have to go into these systems, because it's complicated and there are people who are called to try to break down these bigger problems, but in the meantime, we're seeing all the blacks get <laughs> driven out of the city, but the are close by. Um, you know, no one can afford to be here. The artists are not having a place to perform. Yes, however, when you have an opportunity, when you get a chance at something, and there's someone who is marginalized, who does not look like you, does not have those resources, does not have the knowledge that you have about the opportunity. How many times do you put a brick in the door and let somebody else take that opportunity? How many times are you in a space and say, hey, somebody's not here? Um, so that's going to be one of the ways. <laughs> I think that we're going to have to do if we all want to survive. And if we want to survive and really put action behind what we say is important to us as artists and as citizens in Austin, Texas. You're going to have to leave opportunities for people of color. You're going to have to say, oh, that would be awesome. That space is free. Yes. But you're going to have to pause and say, hey, what other organizations of color, what other organizations don't have this opportunity and should be? I appreciate those comments because I think that uh, while we have stressors and has been connected between the arts and gentrification throughout history in every city, in Austin obviously it's exacerbated by the racial history and, and by systemic racism that kind of creates another layer of complexity. Uh, so you have the arts community and you have the African American and you have the African American arts community that, or other people of color that kind of have different things. But I would like to kind of make a distinction between residential displacement and cultural and historical displacement. Uh, to a degree, uh, one is about economics, the other is about erasure in a certain way. Uh, the economics of this area are extraordinary. Uh, I've lived in this area for 20 whatever years. So I've seen from a time that uh, East Austin wasn't acknowledged as a place in Austin, you know. Uh, I was surprised when I first moved here, you looked at the, the apartment guy and they had listings from everywhere. <laughs> Nothing east, it's like there wasn't an east side, you know. And so from there to where we are now, it's obviously a hell of a journey, and there's a lot of that's driven by economics that are beyond our control. But the cultural, the historical uh, 
displacement or the erasure are things that the arts community can play a special role in. And, and it is attempting to, but I think that those efforts have got to be very robust and acknowledge the fact that racial inequities don't correct themselves. Uh, uh, those asymmetries, those imbalances don't correct themselves. They take extremely proactive, conscious, self-reflective, oftentimes painful, uh, looking in the mirror as ourselves as a society and city to kind of acknowledge. So, you know, just, I think that you know, there are other questions that come on. I'm not going to go on with that. We'll, we'll get to other stuff. Yeah, I, I think I really enjoy that perspective. And, and one, I just wanted to say thank you guys for the colleagues here that I have here that are in conversation with me um, and also for you guys showing up and wanting to be and engaging in this conversation in a, I think, uh, hopefully in a constructive and, and compassionate way. Thank you for that breathing exercise. I really needed to breathe, actually. Um, and as, as somebody that has familiar history with East Austin and also being an artist and basically like Contra like many of you guys, contradictory, co contradictory, like, you know, I live in contradiction, you know, and, and I think that was the most challenging thing about being on this panel was that I have, um, I have multiple perspectives on the issues of displacement and gentrification, um, being a product of displacement, but also being an agent of it as an artist um, and, and working in that industry. So I've you know, taken a lot of time and care and continue to do so um, to think about that and how it affects, you know, myself and, and the folks around me and my direct community, but, but also in my location of like, how can I do better, be better? Um, and, and taking some of the questions that Florinda mentioned, like how can I help support other people with the privilege, um, space, opportunity, and platform that I do have? So. Um, but culture is something that's not always connected to the arts. It's culture is your everyday mundane opportunities to talk to people on the street, um, where you you know go and share meals. I mean, culture is is, is a is a wide range of, of things. And so, when those when communities get broken up, are changed or shifted, that you know those everyday going on is changed too. So all of a sudden, you don't have the same neighbors to have these conversations. Or continue these conversations, um, and you don't have the same places where you, where you the gathering spaces, where ideas um, and, uh, you know, people can connect and engage and, 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 and you know, in, involve each other with each other's lives, you know? Um, so those are some of the things I was thinking about when thinking about displacement and, like, shift of culture. It's like, how, you know, housing, again, is a different issue, but, um, what is really the cultural fabric that's disrupted and, and displaced when developers and other things come in and change and shift a neighborhood and a city? Uh, I was thinking of this today. You know, I'll be honest, it's really hard for me to participate in arts events in the city sometimes. Things like the East Austin Studio Tour or events that you know, are taking place in East Austin on the east side, uh, especially like formerly industrial sites, it's something about it that I guess I stay away from because I'm still, I'm someone that's interested in learning about the past and how these spaces affected the neighborhood, I guess, when it was before gentrification happened. So it just feels odd, I guess, when I go to former warehouses or spaces like that on the east side that a lot of art spaces are opening up in. I guess I'm still looking for that, like a moment of closure, I don't know, some acknowledgement of the damage that was done to you know, our people back in the day. Uh, some reflection, some, it can be a plaque, it can be something small, I guess, to just make people know what used to be there. Uh, make people know, I guess, that before it was an arts district, it was considered this. Um, if there's a way for the arts community to maybe address that tension or that uncomfortableness that I feel, I don't know if anyone else feels, but it's just hard for me to join, I guess, as someone that grew up here. It's, I'm still getting used to it. And, you know, I'm someone that grew up, I'm like a child of Austin museums, you know, I went to the Children's Museum, you know, 
the Harry Ransom Center, like the free public places, the affordable places that felt a little more welcoming, I guess. Felt more like it's city owned, so this is part of us, you know, this is your your space, you can come here to take in art. Um, I guess I don't feel that same vibe in certain new art spaces. Some do a good job than others. Uh, but that's a change I would like to see, at least an issue that I address. Okay. Yeah. So um, I think you heard a little bit about you know what folks think about what folks can do positively, and I'm sure there's tension in this room right now from some of y'all at these arts organizations who felt some of that sting. Like, are they talking about me? Who are they talking about us? Yeah. <laughs> yes. And it is all right, right? Because that is the thing. You have to acknowledge that. And you have to acknowledge the displacement that has occurred and also the loss. I find myself sightseeing in East Austin. I'm sightseeing. My mother is driving with me and I'm telling her her neck is going to break off because she's like, what is that? What is that? What is that? What is that? Right? And so I see you have to, my family has been here for seven generations. Okay? So you have to understand when I look at things, I, I just went driving the other night and I was like, wow. In about 10 years, am I going to recognize anything? Literally, anything. My parents still live in the house they um, bought in the early 60s and in East Austin. And so I, I do really invite um, those of you who are doing arts and who um, um, have art spaces, like we're going to talk about sharing the resources is incredibly important at this point. The space, the having space for arts program and arts events to happen, y'all don't understand. <laughs> Some of you understand, but it is incredibly um, disheartening to for that to be the biggest barrier when there is so much to be offered um, to folks. And so yes, put that brick in the door. Don't just put the brick in the door. Then come ask us, what do you need? And, and so it's not. I think we, when we're when we're talking about making that change and thinking about and including folks. Ask folks what they need and be willing to give that. And if you're not willing to give that, please tell us. We are all right with that. Don't make it seem like this is a space where we are welcome and then you get to sit back and blame us for not attending and not coming when there are real reasons why we don't um, collaborate and work together and do things. People are always asking people of color organizations and artists of color, why don't we work with so-and-so? With the racial history and tension in this community, um, that is very damaging and hurting to folks. And so um, we can't afford to do that because art is life. Art is life. And if art is life and life is art, then you have to understand how those things go together for people trying to just do their art and do their life. And so um, there is a whole lot given around how to work positively together. Um, but also, just make sure you're centering the needs and voices of those people who are most marginalized in this community, particularly if you have resources. Algo has a resource. We have a space, a very small space, but we let folks use that. You hear me? The community room? Loretta's like, can I come up in there and rehearse? Oh yeah, here's a key. That's what I do, right? Because I know that people don't have that, and so we don't have a lot of stuff, but what we have, we are willing to share it with folks and have been. So I invite those of you who have an abundance <laughs> um, to also do that. So, um, so we'll move on to the next one. Um, successful creative place taking can result in changes to social spaces and physical spaces. So I just that right? Creative place making is also a chance to build relationships between diverse partners. Um, so anybody, would anybody like to start with that one? Um, I think the idea of placemaking is, is kind of important in a lot of ways because there are a lot of different levels to talk about in terms of how things happen, in terms of programming, or in terms of funding, or in terms of access. But the idea of physical places is kind of important. Um, and there are a lot of champions in Austin's history of people that have tried to do things. Uh, I, I celebrate Kenny Durham's backyard. I mean, you know, uh, a place where food and music and art and so on kind of guys. And, and I, I thought Harold McMillan, in a way, that's kind of somebody who's been among many, but certainly somebody for many years, decades, has been trying to kind of like set an example for how to preserve, how to kind of create places and moments and so on. Uh, and we've all learned 
and hopefully benefit to some degree from examples like that. Um, another kind of more distant example um, is a, a place in uh, Dorchester in Boston called the uh, Sustainability Guild uh, International, and it's something called coll Collaborative Alchemy. But it's a, a, a place, it's actually in that neighborhood that has a long history of activism and addressing these kind of issues in one way or another. Uh, and it's a physical place that actually deals with a holistic notion of kind of communal well-being. And so there is kind of an idea of factors that sometimes miss. And we heard a little bit about that, is that when you talk about collaborations, or you talk about placemaking, or you talk about kind of trying to kind of reach across uh, cultural, racial, Borders, there has to be a sense of kind of mutual respect and eye to eye agency that has to occur. And, you know, this place is kind of, or these examples, I think, are things that are attempt to try to kind of create those eye to eye kind of issues. But those are just two examples of physical place making that I think are really good examples to look at. I'm sorry, I'm not <laughs> um, what I would like to kind of just talk about is when we, this idea of collaborating and then collaborating across cultures with different people in a racially charged city. It ain't going to be easy. <laughs> um, it's not going to be easy. Um, and because I belong with organizations, I can represent some women. I say, white folks, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be very complicated. Um, you're not going to, for either one of us, be able to issue an invitation and have somebody jump in and like, oh, look, now we're best friends and we're going to work. It, it, there's a lot of hurt, a lot of healing that has to also be taking place. Um, so just, I, I, I did want to put that out there because I think when we think about collaborations, it's just like, oh, well, we'll just work with them and then the things will be good and then we have the microaggressions and then we have the historical context and then we have nobody feels safe and then the thing doesn't work. So I guess maybe something I think that, because we're thinking positive, like we're all going to have to be patient. Like it's going to require a lot of patience and a lot of hard work. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better out with this thing it's just always doing. Um, but I think that when we think about collaborations, that you can't ignore the history. And if you ignore the history, that automatically will place your organization in a place of, um, of being not genuine. Um, and it's okay for us to be honest about the problems in our city. We all know that we all see it, we can talk about it. Um, but those just relationships aren't gonna happen as easily as we think. It's gonna take a couple of different tries. It's gonna take a lot of work. Um, so I do think that uh, when we're talking about collaborating, or even holding space for other people, just as you have it, doesn't mean you're gonna run over and want to be in the sea in the moment because it's just we're healing. <laughs> we're all healing personally. We're healing as a city. Um, so I think that if we're thinking about like, okay, what is the right way, like positive of our action items is just remembering that piece of just being patient with each other, understanding that it's bigger, like it's a bigger issue, so it's not gonna have an easy fix. Um, and you have to just keep being putting making yourself be available. So keep being the brick in the door. That's gonna be my thing. What's going on with that? Uh, that's just an old cost to me. Um, so I do want to throw Valerie Bridgman uh, out there because I do think that that's something for her. Um, but I learned one of my elders. Um, but yeah, it's not going to be easy. And just having the space is not going to, or making, showing up, you're going to have to keep showing up and keep showing up. And then also, when we're talking about just place making, as our allies, as allies to artists, as allies to people of color, as to allies to marginalized people, you are the first front in. Because, okay, so new people come into Austin, right? Somebody's going to have to be in charge of marketing and PR and getting these people on board about what it means to be awesome. And it's not going to be the marginalized black folks that need to do that. That's a perfect job for some people in this room um, that are in the neighborhoods, live in the neighborhoods now where we have people that are not from Austin. Getting those people to know about what's going on in the art communities. Getting those people to show up at places that are supporting um, artists and treat, you know, old school awesome folks. Like, I think it's, that we're also going to have to do that. So, yeah. I mean, I, th I think I echo that sense of like wanting to repair the harm and it not being an easy thing. And, and hopefully I'll get to see some of that repair in my generation, but also I know that it might not happen. And coming to terms with that reality, um, but also acknowledging like the imperfections of like whatever solutions that we do try, like they're not gonna be perfect. And you know, I will, I will speak to like thinking about um, 
thinking about coming into a neighborhood or a space that you're not native to or not from, and there's a fine line between fitting in with a neighborhood and appropriating it and, and what kind of placemaking that creates um, by appropriating the brand of whatever being in East Austin is, or in particular areas of East Austin, appropriating the Spanish language because you think that that's gonna somehow communicate that you're part of it, but you don't know its history, things like that. Those things can be very painful. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and you're right, the conversations aren't gonna be, you know, as much as, as much as I'd like to believe that you could just go and ask those people, the people that are native to the neighborhood, what they want, sometimes that's not, on, that's not on the first thing on their mind, it's like telling somebody what they want. And sometimes they don't know what they want, um, and it's, I think that patience of like trying to figure things out together, because I don't, I don't know 100% if there's, there's any way to stop certain things that are in motion currently in the city. So that doesn't mean that there isn't always room to repair and to do things better and to, to make progress be better. But there is gonna be some problems and imperfections happening even in any, any of our work, we're just sitting here. So that accountability is important to have. You don't have to speak. I just want to make sure. No, this is a in mind of a, a really bad example of this place to be uh, in Austin, or what not to do, I guess. <laughs> um, this happened in 2017, I believe. Um, they tore down the old Habitat for Humanity Restore over on Chicone. Is it Chicone? Come on, right. Uh, across the city from Chalmers, of course. Uh, so I had this beautiful mural wrapping around the side of the building. Uh, some of it newer graffiti, uh, but the one that always caught my attention was like the 90s style mural. Some like temples, uh, a lot of Aztec imagery, low riders, fantasy characters. You could tell it was painted by kids. Uh, and that's what some people had told me that it was a project done with kids in the neighborhood. Uh, it was done to get them to collaborate on a mural instead of tagging, you know, instead of getting involved with other things. I think that was a time with like, a lot of gang activity, so it was supposed to be a positive message. Um, and I know they mentioned that building at the Historic Landmark Commission, you know, because it was up for demolition that they were discussing the merits of preserving what stood out to them. Uh, but it was weird to me, they only characterized it as vandalism. I guess they said the structure's vandalized, but it's worth it if we say this little section of the windows because it goes back to the 30s industrial type window. The windows were, I guess, the most important part of the building, but not uh, this mural. And so they ended up demolishing it, they say it's part of the, the precious windows or whatever, the frame. Um, but then I saw like, some website or some like Instagram post, Cielo Property Group. Uh, they had like models posing in front of the mural before it was demolished. There was like a guy with a fixed gear bike and then someone else with like a handbag. Um, it was like the same people that demolished the mural are now trying to market. include it, yeah, market it and say like live here, live the east, or just this is the place to be. Uh, and it was really offensive, it just made me mad. I know it made a lot of people mad online. Um, yeah. I shared, because I had shared photos of the mural just to, I guess, as a call to anyone in the community, you know, that this is a neighborhood landmark that's about to be torn down. Uh, so I take photos and just, you know, people commented with memories and stuff. It was just interesting that they didn't take photos of Chalmers Court. You know, they didn't take photos of the Comal Food Store, you know. That's at the same intersection, that's the same block, but they just selected certain things, and I guess, you know, I didn't see people like us in the marketing or anything. Uh, so they definitely got called out. I think they removed their tag from the post uh, online, but that was a bit of a bad example of place making on the east side.
what not to do. We can call it what not to do. So um, the next question we'll focus on is around um, each of you, your artistic practice around cultural work and how you are, how you might be addressing um, changes in Austin um, around um, the urban scape and historic communities of color and economic um, accessibility. accessibility. So, um, maybe we'll start with the key session. Well, um, I'm an artist that works in paint and collage, so I work a lot with uh, found images, and the way that I use and employ found images, specifically in the last um, you know, decade that I've been making work, um, is, is thinking about what these images tell me about my heritage, and like how I'm learning a lot about my Mexican heritage through information being fed back to me in um, like Time Life books and National Geographic's, like seeing myself in these pictures, but in these like very confusing ways and, and sort of almost like alternate realities, but also trying to glean out of them as, um, as images um, what part might be true and what part isn't and how I can utilize them with the gestures of paint that I use to retell a story that's uniquely mine and my perspective. Um, but in, in that work, there's, a, I mean, as you know, Alan, like looking at images of, you know, the past, you learn so much in just the image, not to mention like the credits that you're reading or who the photographer was or whatever snippet that that editor of that, you know, informational book um, wanted to say about a particular region of Texas or uh, Mexico, which is specifically what I seek out is a lot of books in, about the Southwest. Um, because I do spend time in Mexico, like thinking about how I can learn about myself, but also like um, refute that in a way, those messages, those um, visual messages. And then also just being in my practice and, and, you know, I have a background in doing art administration and education in, um, and, and work, I think, you know, for me in my practice, working collectively is really important to me because I get to continue learning from other people and having conversations that are outside of my studio practice um, and into the practice of organizing other people, but also learning a little bit more about myself as a cultural producer and how that affects other people. So it's a constant um, process, I think. And I think being able to give yourself as a creator, as a producer, the flexibility to be able to make mistakes, and I know I already said imperfections and mistakes, I think there's something really important about humbling yourselves, whether it's you guys in the audience. Um, I certainly do. I try to humble myself and not think that I know everything because I don't. And I'm constantly learning or like I do in my artistic practice, unlearning things that are, you know, being taught to me as truth. So um, that's, I guess, how I think about uh, my particular heritage and culture in respect to my studio practice. So if you just make sure you um, also include around how your work is related to, like might be related to some of the changes, and like either preserving or recognizing or um, bringing forth that. So. Um, my, my background is in community murals, so I, I'm kind of a product of the Chicago mural movement. So my work primarily is centered on the idea of how communities uh, empower themselves visually, uh, materially. Uh, structurally, physically, in areas uh, that are oftentimes under duress or other kind of things. Uh, in Austin, uh, when I did the Rhapsody mural on 11th Street, uh, it's, it's, it fascinates me to kind of go down 11th Street now. At that time, there was nothing on 11th Street. Between I-35 and Navasota, there was nothing. You had the Victory Grill that was alive, barely, you know, kind of keeping a pulse. Um, you had, uh, yeah, the, the Masonic Lodge it has always been quietly <laughs> there. But beyond that, there was nothing. There were no stakeholders, there were no buildings, there were no businesses, there was nothing like that. And when I did that work, one of the things that I wanted to do when I researched the history of the 11th and 12th Street corridor, uh, I wanted to create something that would have a sense of permanence. Uh, at that time, the language and the talk was that there would be a balance, that as development came, 
They didn't, you know, the people that had been here a long time, residents would be protected and preserved. That there would be this formula that would somehow may allow this coexistence to occur and evolve. Uh, Partly because I've, obviously you see this happen over and over. This is not a, a new play. This is like a rerun of the same play in many ways. And, you know, I, I hoped, but I also doubted in many ways. Uh, I wanted uh, that mural to stand regardless of what happened after that. Uh, and one of the things that I think is kind of metaphoric, not just in the imagery, but even in the structure of the wall, is because the, the wall is a mosaic, you couldn't have expansive joints like walls do. Walls have expansive joints, you can't have expansive joints. So the engineer said the only way you can do the wall is if you build a footing way down. So the footing goes like 14 feet underground, you know, it's like a thick every kind. So the, any wall can be taken down and the mural can be destroyed. That one's kind of hard to take down. So <laughs> part of it was the iconography, part of it was a physical object, part of it was kind of a hope that this work would stand in light of kind of what the best ideal was, but kind of an also understand that as a work of art that was going to be there in the event that the likely or perhaps inevitable. Uh, well, my work um, deals a lot of change, obviously. Uh, it came about that way. Um, I started the page two years ago, the HX Bar Archive. Um, I was just, you know, really frustrated because of how fast everything was going away and you know, getting uh, demolished, the displacement. Um, I've always been interested in just history, reading, Austin history to find whatever I could at the public library. But it was hard to find things about, you know, Mexican Americans, African Americans. Um, it was hard to find anything about the East Side. And if it was there, it was like two sentences on one page that said, Blacks and Mexicans have been here since this time. And, um, you know, it was all about like LBJ, it was all about people like, at the top, the mayors, you know. Um, I never really got a sense of who the people were. Um, I only got that, I guess, through elders in the community, uh, through my family, or just meeting people, a lot of times on the bus. Uh, other Native Austinites who could tell me, oh, you know, this used to be here, or I went to the original Anderson High School, and oh man, we had the best school, the best band, you know, the uh, best football team. So I created it as a way to kind of just compile all those stories, photos, artifacts that I wish, you know, I could see in a museum or in a book, uh, have it there for others to see, uh, and also for others to add to the story too, because I'm, you know, there's only so much I can do. I feel like that's been a joy too, to have people recognize their family members and all the photos, um, you know, share memories in the comments and stuff. Um, I don't know how it came about starting this. I started using this hashtag. It's not national or anything. It's just like it came to me, I guess, to call something a, a barrio landmark. You know, when talking about local restaurants, community murals, even an intersection in 12th and Chicon, you know, it's, it's a neighborhood landmark. You know, Como Food Store, neighborhood landmark. Um, it just kind of clicked with me as being different from. Austin landmarks. To me, Austin landmarks, I guess that always stood out as being very touristy, you know, it's in any of the tourist materials, I guess they only use Garden Springs, the Capitol, um, like the hills or something, maybe a Whole Foods. Uh, they never really faced east, you know, they never really looked at the bottom of the working class faces here. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it was meant to just pay respect to to these neighborhoods, to the people. Um, the name kind of was a tribute to the Museo de Barrio. It was before my time. Uh, I don't know if anyone remembers up here. It was sort of like the Mexican American Cultural Center before it existed. Uh, it was on East First Street, East of San Charles right now. Uh, they did a lot of the same work. Uh, a lot of uh, Chicano art, a lot of family history on display in their gallery. Um, a lot of celebrations for the other Muertos, Mexican Independence Day. Uh, but it doesn't exist anymore. I mean, it exists in people's memories on paper uh, at the Austin History Center. But 
it was that idea, you know, to pay respects to the people that were doing this type of work before me, you know, documenting the history of the barrio, and, you know, to have it exist digitally, you know, because just the thought of having a, my own physical space just seems impossible, you know. I would want this to be a museum, you know. Um, I'm grateful that the Carver reached out to me in the past to collaborate on an exhibit. Uh, but this is stuff that should have already existed, you know, in a museum. Um, I shouldn't have found it in like thrift stores, you know, or just kind of for sale photos of like, old restaurants, you know, on East 6th Street. Um, so it's just a virtual museum for for the people, mainly. Um, you know, I don't profit off of it at all. Um, and I know there are some Facebook page of like Austin Urbanists that they started discussing it. Um, but I feel like it's a little bit of their heads, I don't know, they weren't really talking about the people involved, they were just talking about policy and numbers. Um, so it was kind of just like proof, further proof that it was meant for, you know, residents. Uh, meant, meant for us to, to share, you know, to discuss, and to honor. Um, so I think that um, before I tell you where I am now, I, I do want, I think it's important to include that. So I just retired um, from a creative action an organization that I've been with for 17 years. It's a nonprofit arts education organization that is uh, this big, beautiful, wrong thing that serves all of these children across um, Austin, Texas, and does really powerful work. Um, when I sat at the table with Karen Michelle 17 years ago, um, what drove my heart in that work was being able to provide uh, young kids that look like me and grew up like me an opportunity to experience something artistic that could change and save their lives just like it did for me. Um, when I retired, the population that we serve did not look like, like me anymore. Um, uh, so I, I wanted to put that in the air. Um, so ever since I was little, like three years ago, I was in my thing. So getting an opportunity to be an administrator for uh, Savage Band Art Theater, a theater that I worked with and held in such high esteem, um, to get in a position that you dream of, and then they're like, what do you mean? Our boys are getting shot. Understandably, <laughs> I am, and so all of these things kind of happened um, and helped. Yeah, this is totally not. But it is because it's where I am now. It, like I, I couldn't do it um, as an artist, as a black woman artist. I seriously felt like I had to question whether I had the privilege of being an artist if I have to fight for. You know, my life, if I have to worry and pray about the lives of my sons, do I really need to be concerned about what we're doing at the You know, it, it became this thing. Um, fighting for space, being down in City Hall, which uh, for the remakes, like all of the theaters that were like trying to like pick up the cross and really fight for us to have space in the city. Um, a fight that we should not have had to even, <laughs> should not have been a thing from the beginning because we're that important to the economic picture of what this city is and what people come here for. Um, I could not go to City Hall one more time to talk to the council again about why art is important, what we bring to this city, and why we needed space when I knew that Blacks and Latinos had already been displaced and there was already nothing I could do about it. I could not stand in front of City Council and ask them about a theater. This Black woman couldn't. Um, and so like that, it was a lot going on. It is a lot to be an administrator, to carry that role, particularly for those folks of color, or for anyone who has a pulse, really. I mean, the world is a pretty safe place. Um, so now what I'm doing with my work, um, because my little art babies are out in the world being great, and uh, so I'm, I'm focusing on myself as a performance artist, as a director, as a writer, um, what my, how my work contributes to the, the preservation of what it is in Austin. Like, my stories are in my bones. They're in my blood. Um, so, my, you know, my uncle, you know, Chester, my own Chester's on 12. 
I've, I've grown up in these places, so that's what I do. I, I, I stay alive, which means I take care of myself, which means that I'm not able to actively be out in the world, I'm advocating for the world, I have to take care of me, <laughs> but I write the work that I get to perform that hopefully provides, um, not only saves me, but helps save my community. Um, so that's what I do. I make sure that theaters that I'm working with now, but you have to bring in a special marketing person because guess what? The person on your staff is not going to be able to reach the communities that I need to reach. And I don't know if y'all know this, but the artists of color love the white audiences, but we really need it to be something more. Like, please use, I mean, I demand, the, the people that I'm working with, I ask, you have to go above and beyond. You're going to have to market to people that you don't market to. You're going to have to make sure the space is available and safe for them. And they're going to have to be able to come here, not just when I'm here, but whenever, like, whenever your doors are open. So it's a big commitment, but that's how I'm helping um, kind of create, carve out our space. Um, if I get opportunities to, you know, I'm, I'm just making sure, like, colorism is a thing. I hold the door. I, I, I will kick that little in and then move out of the way so somebody else can come through. But I think that that's just kind of what we all have to do. And that's what I've committed to do as an artist, whether it's on stage, whether it's doing workshops with APD. But somebody's got to do it. <laughs> so that we can, you know, get some solutions going. Like that's how um, that's how I'm fighting for my city through my work. Um, and again, just taking care of myself, trying to be healthy, tell the truth, and be honest, so that my stories can come out, so that my ancestors are pleased. <laughs> which is awesome. Thank you. That is not our work. That is the work of folks 
who are participating in that, but who also earn places of privilege to, um, to make those changes. So I invite you all to take that question and, and to share it with the people you have contacts with about what is it that you all could do to eliminate, to slow down, um, to change the trajectory of the changes in the city that are displacing black folks and Latinos and other folks, and just making it completely unaffordable for people to be here. I don't know how many artists this in this community. Um, I'm sorry. We don't. And so, um, and so yes, and so I, so that was a question that I had just decided to kind of move past. Um, so, I can we give it to them? We will give it to them, but we're not going to give it to them. Yeah. So that's our question. So some of y'all might want to speak to that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so I do. Can you can you hold that just a moment? Okay. So I'm just trying to that you're one Riverside. I'm in the one Riverside. And right across from that is the Riverside Arts District. And in fact, actually, one of the people here, a uh, part of the media, um, Shay Little. Thank you. 
However, I also run an organization where I'm extremely concerned who has to, you know, who has to sit down and So I want to um, acknowledge that. And I think when I started the conversation, that was acknowledging the elephant in the room, which to me is not the elephant in the room because you can't talk about this without, without, without talking about life and how it's affected and impacting people um, individually. So I just want to say that. Can um, I also request maybe a different conversation later because I do think that that's it. Yes. Uh, and so I just want to know what's going on. Right. And so folks who don't know that, um, please share the information if you, um, and so we appreciate um, folks trying to give different perspective. We know that organizations um, and folks have participated in things that people have been harmed by, and um, it is our right to acknowledge that, but we ask everybody to do better. Um, and, and, and we also know that sometimes folks are not going to do better. They're just not going to. And then we have to figure out you know, how, do we, how do we move forward. And a lot of you know, what um, people of color often do is shit, we just do our thing. Y'all go over there and do that, because we ain't got time for that. We doing life over here, okay? While y'all talking about art, art separately, we doing life. And so, because we don't, we can't afford to do that, because we don't die. We're going to die from trying to do that, and so we can't do that, and we won't do that. Um, so I just um, need to kind of and say that a little bit. So um, I know there are many other questions um, and comments in the room, and so what we also, what I would like is we know the problems, and if you don't know the problems, you know, we can talk about those, but I also would like to talk about solutions, what people are doing, um, also share what you might need, right? Like something that might not be said, so it would be great not to piggyback off what other folks have said, just state what it is that you have to say, um, and also just acknowledge um, just how you're saying it and who's saying it, right? Who's in this room? Because when we look at this room, we look at this room, y'all. Some of y'all will, will look at this room and see, oh, this is a perfectly fine room. And other folks will look at this room and go, there are a lot of people missing from this room. Why is that? I do that as somebody who runs a queer people of color organization. I am always looking and taking on this on who's not in the room. And I take absolute responsibility for that. So um, just know that. So I want to take this moment um, to have a discussion in this beautiful museum. Um, to, give folks the opportunity to kind of um, respond um, to people. So who would like to, and I'm going to be strategic in this moderation. Does that mean? I just wanted to know more about um, the space when you're talking about the need for spaces. Um, is, uh, is it money? Are there other organizations that have space? Organizations that, um, like the MAC or whatever, that are, do people not share the spaces that they have? Is there no sliding scale? Just talking more about the spaces that you need and what spaces are, are out there for you but you don't have access to. I've been talking to people before. Like live workspace, studio space, like space, like what kind of space, like living space, like what space? No, I'm sorry, I meant art space because the, the last time that, we, that this conversation was here and this time people are talking about, I know there's two different spaces, but I'm talking about art space right now. Yeah, I mean, I think that I'm very fortunate. I've had the same studio space since 2005, like tucked away in the neighborhood. I won't tell you where. But I'm, I'm very, very lucky to have an independent studio space to be able to work out. But um, I think when buildings get taken over and, and be vision and be developed, this, you know, I, I, I for one, want to advocate for housing for people to live that might be displaced, a right to return, that sort of thing that needs to happen before I necessarily, I mean, I can make things in my living room if I have to. Like, I'm not necessarily concerned about artists having workspace, but I think performance space is really important because, you know, I don't necessarily need people to come and see me work, but, but that's completely different for those that are in the performing arts, so. To that about the space being eradicated or changed. So I'm going to give the mic to Tanya Penny here. Um, and partially it's because Tanya does art stuff and is always looking for space. So. 
Yes, I can. Uh, hi, I'm Tanya Penny. I'm with Dance Africa Fest and the Night of the Dance. And specifically in terms of space with Dance Africa Fest, it's an African diaspora dance festival, and we are challenged all the time to find space, affordable space where the rate is transparent. We were we partnered with Bella Effie, who came in at the last second because the space that we had been used to using um, was unwilling to give us their quote for months and really did not acquiesce until I rolled up in my Jeep and sat there and waited for someone to come out. So if we knew from the, from the get-go how much it would be, we would have had the option to say no or fundraise. Uh, but we reached out and we found space. So for us, it's cost and availability and just transparency. Because if it costs too much, we'll just take our ball and go somewhere else. But if you keep telling us, we'll just wait and wait, you know, we, we don't have time to fundraise. We don't have time to give that money. Why wouldn't they tell you how much it was? They didn't want you. We can, we can have a question. Okay. So, so I was real quick that some of that also is around there's limited space. And so what that means is me and Tiny trying to do events on the same, oh, it's already booked. So some of that is with limited space becomes limited availability. Um, but also, um, you know, you have to fill out some forms sometimes and, and ask for quotes and whatever. Sometimes people don't even respond. For me, the question becomes, is that racism? Or is that homophobia? Or both? Because you don't even tell me. I'm just, I'm just inquiring about is the space, is the space available? Like, I'm not even asking price yet. I'm saying, are these dates available? And if I'm waiting and waiting and waiting, you know, and so sometimes it's not just about the money, it is a lot about the money, but it is also those things around who gets priority, who gets responded to. You know, it's like a job application. Why do you deny me? And then there's lack, of, there's a lack of space. I mean, that's the thing. We don't have any, that's the problem. Um, and the amount of money that you need to build a space is, we don't have that either. Um, I think that if we, because all the money that's moving to Austin is not art, they think that they don't, they're not, apparent, obviously they're not like breaking their necks trying to support the arts, <laughs> um, which is unfortunate. And do I think there's things the city could be doing to help change that? Absolutely. Um, but yeah, so there's lack of space. I think also, unfortunately, what ends up happening is that the natural uh, inclination, which, you know, out of you know, love and respect, it's like, well, what about the Mac? Well, what about the Mac? The Mac's the Mexican American Cultural Center that should probably get half priority go to Mexican American theater artists and practitioners. And no, that doesn't mean the white people that do things that are in Spanish, like, <laughs> so, and then we need heavily on cultural centers. Where you have, yeah, we have the carver. Is the carver mean you like who gets to use it? Who has the money to be able to use it? Who has? I, I think that the city is definitely becoming better, especially as in a rush. You're like, oh, let's do this. Like, let's create this program. This program to help save. But they don't do due diligence in making sure that the artists of color have access to that information or and know about it. Um, so that's something that I've seen. So there's not enough space. How do we take the limited resources we have, still give priority to artists of color? Um, yeah, so it's, but yeah, no money. There's no money. I wish there was. There should be theaters everywhere. And then the, the smaller theater companies are just trying to pay the artists so they can afford to live here. That's not fun. <laughs> um, let me say relative to the Carver. Carver needs your assistance and your voice at city council. If Carver needs to expand, it won't expand unless it has your voice. If we need more dance studios, we need your voice. If we need more classrooms, we need your voice. Please, let us have your voice. Any other questions? I actually was pointing. No. Hi, my name is Don Hawson, and I work with a cross-generational, cross-cultural group here in, in Blackshire Prospect Hill neighborhood which is the crown at the top of Prospect Hill, where there are many African-American institutions, the two schools, Blackshaw Elementary School and Houston Tilton University. 
um, and in the black churches in our neighborhood. And so our um, board president is working at um, getting her dissertation right now. And what Gina is looking at is how historic black colleges and universities interact with the surrounding neighborhood in times of gentrification. And so we're getting involved in our community. I've been living there since 2004. I've called myself gentrification line. I bought through the affordable housing program, um, having fought 15 years before for the Affordable Housing Act in Washington with primarily African American people to get that policy in place. Um, so coming up April 26th, we're going to unveil a mural. We're working with an African American artist. Um, we really think affirmative action is important. Um, nationally, they got rid of affirmative action, and Austin is struggling with that when they're looking at the affordable thousand dollars that are available right now. There's $3.5 million available that the African American Resource Advisory Commission um, works to designate as specifically for African American housing. So we're looking at and talking to our partner groups. As we do the artwork, we're also doing the economic work because gentrification is both cultural. We, we know our neighbors feel invisible often when we walk by and don't look at them, the newcomers. So white folks in the room, we're good people and we're human people. So we need to look at and know our neighbors and support our neighbors and talk to them and not ignore them because that's a bad feeling and that's bad for the health. Um, uh, so I want to just invite everyone to come both to the Carver. There's going to be an exhibit that's in association with this mural. And the mural is what I call a piece of creative place keeping. So there's creative place making that we've been talking about. I also like the idea of creative place keeping. So we're working with our, our neighborhood and the long-time generational neighbors and historians to um, highlight the life of the long-time principal, Friendly R. Rice. He was an African-American educator and innovator, and his face and his story are going to be splashed in bright, living color on the front walls of the school coming this April. And we're excited about that because that school is changing and the numbers are changing, it's painful to see that. So we want to support the African-American families who are in that school and who may want to come to that school to see themselves reflected and their history reflected. And in doing that, we're going to have um, Ms. Bonnie Rice, the daughter of that principal, Ms. Arlene Young, uh, Mr. Harrison and Bright, and um, uh, Ms. Gina Tillis, who's our board chair, to come and talk about that history, to educate people about the history of this neighborhood, so that when that mural gets created, It'll be inspired by that history, and people will understand that history, and it'll be there to be seen, and we're going to keep the place. Thank you. So come out for the event. How about you? I would just like to uh, echo the executive director's comments. If there were this many people who showed up to City Hall to protest the demolition, it would not happen. If there were this many people who showed up to City Hall, to support real initiatives that would have lasting impact on this community, they would actually happen. Engagement and advocacy at City Hall is incredibly important, regardless of how many, how discouraging and how many failures you think you'll get. Showing up is incredibly, incredibly important. If we don't show up, they will. Thank you.
has not, an art project has not led to displacement, but has led to creative place keeping for our own parent. It's Albert Mahia's turn, actually. <laughs> I forget who he was. It's Albert. Albert Mahia. Uh, I, I, yeah, I'm like, because I'm, 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 they gave me a seat, a way that I'm going in. Because <laughs> I think like there's been this, like what we learn at school is, right, like first the artists come, and then they drive back, you know, they move in, they bring value, blah, blah, blah. Then you'll hear some other schools of thought, I'm like, whoa, why did I get left to leave first? Well, it's, that's how it happens. Um, can we stop in here? Um, <laughs> uh, so if the building is not torn down, like as of like two days from now, then maybe, but like overall in the city, I personally am like, it's just, a, it's all right. <laughs> but, uh, but what's happening here is happening all over the country, which is a larger conversation, I think, about systematic racism. <laughs> I mean, which is that thing. So do I personally think, like, th does this loop here in Austin stop? No, if we stop valuing capitalism, if we stop thinking more about money, like, yeah, we have these changes that are happening, but if people came in and they loved and respected the arts, this would be a totally different conversation. <laughs> if we had people moving in that really cared about diversity in their neighborhood, like, this would be a totally different conversation. So I think we can't, have that conversation about the Bible's other pieces. Alan, can you speak um, for a second? Because about, um, you talked about not feeling welcome and not going to lots of spaces, but there have been a few where you have felt um, welcome and open, you know, embracing. So maybe you could talk a little bit in response to their question about, like, maybe those spaces that you've been able to go to and what has made them feel open to you. Sure. Uh, it's not many, unfortunately. So, the one or two minutes? It was a while ago, uh, Beastbox Festival did a program related to the level in the neighborhood. I thought it was really respectful. Uh, incorporated the memories of a lot of residents there. Told the story of the former tank farm that was there. So, talking about environmental racism at the same time, <coughs> creating a structure, recreating the structure of the tanks uh, on the actual site. Uh, so it's done by artists um, and then some other conceptual work, artwork on the site. I have never seen something like that in the city before, so I want to see more things like that that tackle those big issues, you know, because that's kind of how I feel, I guess, when I walk into a lot of art spaces. That's just it makes me think of why you know, railroad tracks, why the warehouses, former incinerators were placed on this side of town. Hmm. Now they're galleries, but the galleries aren't really welcoming you. Like, welcome to the former, you know, so and so, or acknowledging that, that harmful past, that story. Um, so that was very unique. Uh, I'm glad they did that. And I guess the other space I can think of is, you know, the City of Austin Arts uh, and Public Places program. They, they restored a, a Chicano mural um, by Hollywood, the Hollywood Power Plant. Now that, that was really cool, I didn't think that was possible. I just thought it was gonna kind of deteriorate um, like most of the other neighborhood landmarks, you know, without any support from the city. The original artists were involved, Robert Herrera, Amanda Martinez, and you know, I, that's something that was new to me too that I didn't think was possible to see something come back to life, supported by the city, um, and not change at all. The area not change is still the same, you know, throwback look. Uh, pyramids and, you know, like Aztec Warrior uh, still fits into the neighborhood. There was a ball game going on when, you know, the mural unveiling was happening. So it seems that unique, you know, I didn't think that that was possible so here. So definitely I want to see the city uh, and others, yeah, restore our landmarks, restore more murals. Thank you. I think that's a, we are out of time now, and I think I wanted to make sure also that we wrapped up on a note that was uh, something that could be done, an example of something that is working and has worked from, from, from an Austin native perspective. And so we know that there, this is a long, long conversation that will continue, um, that is necessary and that we need to have it for another. 24,000 million hours um, and days, and so um, we appreciate
appreciate those of you who've come to um, really be open to this conversation that's difficult and hard. And um, know that um, this is a series, and so folks will be back. And so I want to thank Alan, John, Soshi, and Florinda um, for being here on the panel. For those of you, um, for, 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 for your energy and your time, because you could have been somewhere else tonight. So I'm thank sorry. you all. I'm sorry. I'm sorry.